keep Bowie quiet. I'm hunting wabbits. Listen, Doc. Now, don't spread this around. But, uh... I am a wabbit! Alma Fudd is the dopey, chicken-brained hunter of the Looney Tunes, and one of the earliest antagonists created for the series. With origins in an earlier character known as Egghead, Alma spent two years in a primitive design, before rotating through others for a further two. Eventually, Alma would emerge as the original adversary of Bugs Bunny, and went on to appear in some of the most beloved Looney Tunes cartoons of all time, continuing today as one of the longest-running characters. In 2021, Alma celebrates 84 years, and to help him I will trace his spotted and often confusing evolution from 1937 to now. To do so, we will look at his entire history, touching on design, personality and even personification changes over more than 8 decades of shorts, series and feature films. In this edition of Cartoon Evolution. <laughs> By the late 1920s, Walt Disney had proven animated films to be a lucrative force in entertainment. Thanks to the insane popularity of his Mickey Mouse and Silly Symphonies cartoons, and almost instantly, major studios began scrambling to commission their own. In 1930, the Warner Brothers studio contracted shrewd businessman and producer Leon Schlesinger to pull together a series of animated films to hopefully rival Disney's success. Schlesinger hired two animators, Hugh Harmon and Rudolph Ising, to independently produce an ongoing series titled Looney Tunes, featuring a character named Bosco, who along with his team of co-stars soon became audience favourites, truly rivalling Mickey in popularity. The series the series was so successful that Warners commissioned a second titled Merry Melodies, which much like Disney's Silly Symphonies, focused on one-shot stories and characters. By 1933, however, the Disney cartoons had run away with popularity, owing to their intricate nature, enormous budgets and exclusive utilisation of technologies such as the three-strip Technicolor process. With Schlesinger denying them such luxuries, his relationship with Harmon and Ising soured, and they soon left the studio, taking their characters with them. Over the next few years, building his own cartoon unit on the Warner's lot, affectionately known as Termite Terrace, Schlesinger and his new team began the search for more star characters. Following a number of fledgling leads, they soon landed on the phenomenal Porky Pig, the first breakthrough star of the Looney Tunes. While Porky continued in popularity for a number of years, the Merry Melodies remained an integral part of the studio's development, continuing to offer up non-sequential shorts that allowed free-thinking directors and animators like Tex Avery to experiment, refine their craft and run wild. Avery was the third director at Warner's to be given his own unit, and while he helped develop the likes of Porky, Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck, and later created such long-running favourites as Droopy, Red Hot Riding Hood and The Wolf for MGM, his uniquely zany and irreverent style arguably lent itself best to these one-shot cartoons. One such cartoon was 1937's Egghead Rides Again, a western parody featuring a dopey wannabe cowboy named Egghead who finds himself constantly failing a series of challenges. This character had a large round head, a bulbous red nose, gigantic circular ears, enormous oval eyes, a stumpy body and huge clown feet. Almost everything about him was shaped like, well, an egg. Some reports suggest that Egghead's looks were inspired by Robert Ripley, the creator of Ripley's Believe It or Not. Despite studio mandates that Merry Melodies were only to be used for one and done characters, Avery brought him back the following year for Daffy Duck and Egghead, ironically also the second cartoon to star the titular duck. However, given that Daffy had debuted in a Porky Pig Looney Tunes cartoon and would predominantly star in that series, Egghead became the first recurring character of the Merry Melodies. In this short, Egghead was depicted as a hunter attempting to catch the madcap and rambunctious Daffy with disastrous consequences. Here he was given hair, blue rings around his eyes and a classic hunter's uniform. Actor Danny Webb lent his voice in an imitation of popular radio comedian Joe Penner. Peepers, 
Oh, well, don't worry about those. The pigeons will eat them up. Oh. Sit down. There's a duck in here. Sit down. While many consider Egghead to have later evolved into Alma Fudd, particularly given this early appearance as a dim-witted hunter, the truth is a little more complex. Between these two Egghead shorts, Avery also released one titled Little Red Walking Hood, an eccentric retelling of the Little Red Riding Hood fairy tale. Throughout the cartoon, a small man continually walks in and out of frame, interceding with the events. This character, while featuring Egghead's distinctively large proportions and red nose, had some notable visual differences. He was bald, had large bushy eyebrows and small squinted eyes, and wore a small derby hat, high collar shirt and green suit. Furthermore, this small man appeared again four months later in 1938's The Isle of Pingo Pongo, in practically the same design, though with a rounder, less egg-like head. And then he appeared again two months after that in Cinderella Meets Fella, in which he had a more substantial role. One month after that, the original design Egghead returned in A Lad in Baghdad, while the small man appeared again one month later in A Feud There Was. As these two designs looked vastly alike and were both voiced by Webb in his Joe Penner imitation, they are often considered or confused as different evolutions of Egghead. However, it's important to distinguish the two as separate characters. Firstly, we need to note that, due to the rotation between designs, if these were both Egghead, the studio would have been dealing with two different variants of the same character at the same time, with the character in different designs, in different shorts, in production concurrently. While this kind of rotation wouldn't be unheard of, it was uncommon. Animation historian Michael Barrier was one of the first to truly expose the two as separate, though also agreeing that the subject is messy, he noted, most of the people involved making the films or publicising them not only had trouble telling the characters apart, but had no idea why they should bother trying. So who exactly was this mysterious second character if not Egghead? Please allow me to introduce you to Elma Fudd. In fact, the first use of the name Alma was on the original lobby card for Isle of Pingo Pongo, his second cartoon. The name was once again featured on Cinderella Meets Fella's lobby card, and then appeared in a cartoon for the first time in A Feud There Was, this time as Alma Fudd, an original 1939 illustration created for an ice cream fountain even bears the name. Meanwhile, the lobby card for Egghead's Aladdin Baghdad features no such reference, and neither did those for ongoing Egghead shorts. At the same time, he would continue to go by the name Egghead in the cartoons themselves. So it's very clear that here we have two coexisting and rotating characters. So why would Avery be using these two almost identical characters concurrently? Well, the answer lies in the exhibitor materials for Cinderella Meets Fella, where Elmer is referred to as Egghead's brother. While Egghead may not have evolved into Alma, Alma was certainly a strange evolutionary offshoot of him. Perhaps it was simply that Avery was playing around with both characters in an attempt to figure out which one he liked best for perpetuity. And by 1939, it seems he'd figured it out as Egghead suddenly disappeared. However, it is interesting to note that throughout that year's cartoons, some of Egghead's features were slyly introduced into the design of Elmer, particularly in A Day at the Zoo, where Elmer was given larger, wider, non-squinted eyes and an Egghead-like nose and facial shape. In the next short, Believe It or Else, however, his egg-like shapes were made more circular, finally making strides towards the character we all recognise today. Up until the 1940s, Elmer was essentially a nothing character with no real purpose. Barrier notes, there was little to connect the Elmer in one of Avery's cartoons with the Elmer in another. He simply helped hold them together, usually by taking part in some running gag. Elmer could be anything his creator wanted him to be because he wasn't much of anything to begin with. So naturally, moving into the next decade, some more changes had to be made if the studio wanted to keep him around as a regular star. In 1940s, Elmer's 
left-handed camera, a short which animation historian Leonard Moulton refers to as an important transitional cartoon. Fellow director Chuck Jones took control of the character, giving him his first proper starring vehicle. Here, Elmer is seen hunting for rabbits for the first time, however, only to photograph, not to kill. Naturally, this is the first time Elmer was pitted against Bugs Bunny. Well, a primitive version of him who, much like Elmer, still hadn't reached his final form. In the short, the bunny constantly torments and tricks Elma, who does very little to provoke him. Despite the bunny being less likeable, the roots of Elma and Bugs' relationship lie in this short. Likewise, the development of Elma's more defined personality, one which Barrier calls not particularly attractive, referring to him as a foolish weakling. For Candid Camera, Jones also had Elma redesigned with a large, hulking stature, a slightly smaller, yet still bulging nose and more exaggerated features. Jones, however, still left the character in the clothes of the previous iteration. Additionally, he was given a brand new voice, now performed by popular radio actor Arthur Q. Bryan, who applied a trademark vocal style that he'd used both on the radio and in the 1939 Avery cartoon Dangerous Dan McFoo. Imagine 60,000 people standing up and chewing their wungs out. This voice gave Alma his now recognizable speech impediment and slow drawl. Now we took away Wabbit over, 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 over there. Frizz Freeling was the next director to tackle Alma, using Jones's version in two historical cartoons, both released in 1940 in quick succession. In both, Alma was used to portray characters. Confederate Honey, set during the American Civil War, saw him as soldier of fortune Ned Cutler, and the hardship of Miles Standish, set during colonial times, saw him as messenger John Alden. While he was dressed in his classic derby hat, he was otherwise dressed in period-specific costumes in both. Avery then returned to the character for another 1940 cartoon, A Wild Hare. This time, however, he too took Jones' Elmer as well as his bunny, now even closer to the final form Bugs. For Wild Hare, Avery took gags directly from Candid Camera, as the bunny constantly fools and embarrasses Elmer. Given that many felt the bunny's actions in the previous short were cruel and unjustified, to make him appear more antagonistic and the rivalry fairer, Elmer was now a fully-fledged hunter with a gun out for the kill. While still dim-witted and naive, he was also made slightly less pathetic and more determined. Respectively, the bunny became less manic and unpleasant, and more rational and, in Barrier's words, playful. Avery not only completely refined and reshaped their famous relationship and personalities, but also restyled them into their most recognisable visual forms. For the cartoon, animator Robert Givens tried his hand at redesigning Alma, making him shorter with more proportioned and less exaggerated features, such as a smaller, more button-like nose. Strangely though, it was coloured red, just like his early days. Givens did keep his large bald head though, proportioning it like that of a baby. As Barrier astutely observed, he now closely resembled Dopey of Snow White. A classic catchphrase was also added to the mix. Be very, very quiet. I'm hunting wabbits. Despite being such a key architect of the character, this was, ironically, Avery's final Elmer cartoon before leaving Warners for MGM in 1941. Despite this, Elmer still hadn't settled just yet, as Chuck Jones returned the character to his more pathetic personality for two more shorts in 1941, Goodnight Elmer and Elmer's Pet Rabbit, the latter of which likewise depicted the rabbit, now officially named Bugs, with his aggressive and nasty temperament again. Strangely though, Jones used Given's new design for Elmer in these shorts, though still dressed him in his original green suit and high collar shirt. In another strange twist, Elmer's design modified once again, where he re-emerged in late 1941's Wabbit Twubble from Robert Clampett. For some reason, Clampett had Elmer redesigned to closer resemble Arthur Q. Bryan, making him much larger and more oafish. This version, dubbed in more recent years as Fat Elmer, oddly stuck around for three additional cartoons throughout 1942, and also appeared in a World War II propaganda short. 
It seems that the filmmakers were still confused about where to take Alma, or perhaps internal conflicts and creative differences led to a kind of tug of war. Because across the four Fat Alma shorts, he was depicted twice as an antagonistic hunter and twice as a simple, hopeless sod who is bullied by bugs with little provocation. Thankfully, this version of the character didn't stick around long, as audiences found him uninteresting and unappealing. By the end of 1942, in Freeling's harebrained hypnotist, he reverted to the form that suited him best, a stupid, hostile hunter who gets what he deserves when provoking his prey. Finally settling into form, Alma instantly became known as Bugs Bunny's main antagonist, with the hunter versus prey formula building the foundation of most of their pairings over the years. While Alma was most often seen as a provocative hunter, on occasion he was still haplessly bullied. There was even a dozen or so shorts where Alma wasn't a hunter at all, at times appearing as a millionaire industrialist, a waiter, and an everyday guy. He even often appeared in themed costumes, and on occasion in his throwback vintage green attire. In fact, this classic look became somewhat of a standard civilian uniform, seen regularly in the 40s and 50s Elma Fudd and Bugs Bunny comics, which were drawn by Warner Studio artists. Of course, Alma wasn't always pitted against Bugs in the cartoons. In nearly 20 shorts, he played rival to Daffy, and in three of Frizz Freelings, he was harassed by Sylvester the Cat. Very few cartoons saw him against irregular or one-and-done antagonists, but some, particularly later ones, did. In the post-war years, a more rambunctious style of cartoons began to emerge, appealing to the tastes of a more gung-ho society. The chase formula was full of action, excitement, conflict and violence, and the hunter vs prey formula quickly grew old and tired. Naturally, so did the pairing of Alma and Bugs, and as such, animators began to develop other foes for the rabbit. Freeling, who'd always seen Alma not as a villain, but as a dumb, pitiful character, devised Yosemite Sam to give Bugs a sharper, more challenging villain. Likewise, finding Sam to be a walkover and too easily outsmarted, Jones later developed the intellectual Marvin the Martian, who he believed was Bugs' one true threat. Regardless, Alma continued to appear regularly, and by the 1950s was even appearing in more cartoons than ever. However, as the years rolled on, filmmakers began to use him more experimentally, to great success. Most particularly, Chuck Jones and his writer Michael Maltese used him to his full potential, opposite Bugs in two extravagant musical chase cartoons. 1950's Rabbit of Seville, a frenetic gag-loaded short set to Rossini's Barber of Seville Opera, and 1957's What's Opera Doc, a parody of Richard Wagner's 19th century operatic pieces. Easily the most extravagant and artistic Warner's cartoon of all time, it utilised vibrant colours, harsh shadows, expressionist design, and more than 100 background drawings by Maurice Noble, 40 more than usual. The cartoon was so avant-garde, it was actually made in secret, with Jones instructing his artists to cheat on their time cards, to convince the studio they were instead working on run-of-the-mill Roadrunner cartoons. What's Opera Doc is now commonly considered the greatest Warner's tune ever, and was the first cartoon of all time to be preserved in the National Film Registry for cultural, historical and aesthetic significance. Similarly, Clampett used Alma as a concert composer and film host in 1943's Corny Concerto, a parody of Disney's then-recent Fantasia. Jones additionally used Alma in 1950's The Scarlet Pumpernickel, a parody of literary classic The Scarlet Pimpernel, which was one of very few ensemble pieces to feature almost every star Looney Tune. Alma's most well-known appearance, however, was arguably in Jones's Hunting Trilogy, a collection of three shorts released between 1951 and 1953, where he was used as an easy-to-manipulate chump against both Bugs and Daffy in some of the wildest, most hilarious, and most iconic Looney Tunes moments of all time. Ones that have been riffed on constantly over the years. 
In late 1959, Arthur Q. Bryan suddenly passed away following a heart attack at only 60 years of age. His final appearance as Elmer was 1960's Person to Bunny. Warner's hired comedic actor Hal Smith as his replacement, however he couldn't quite replicate Bryan's performance and was let go after only two cartoons. Having appeared in over 60 cartoons, not counting the 12 additional Egghead era shorts, he was retired completely, following a final brief appearance in 1962's Crow's Feet, where he was given no dialogue. Bugs himself was retired only two years later, when Warner Brothers Animation closed due to dwindling interest in theatrical cartoons. Though Warners began outsourcing the shorts to other studios, they were produced on a budget limited nature and have been referred to as abysmal by Moulton. Thankfully our favourite duo were kept far, far away from them. On the other side of the entertainment landscape however, The Bugs Bunny Show regularly featured Elmer cartoons. First airing in 1960, the series repackaged classic Looney Tunes for television between newly animated wraparounds. Elmer, now voiced by Mel Blanc, often appeared in these too. Additionally, he appeared in regular commercials created to platform the series' sponsors. Due to the popularity of Looney Tunes on TV, more than 20 primetime specials were aired between the late 1970s and early 1990s, many of which took on the same package format and featured classic Elmer shorts. A small handful of them additionally featured newly animated wraparounds or entirely new stories and short cartoons. Most notably, Elmer appeared in 1978's A Connecticut Rabbit in King Arthur's Court, which saw Bugs coming head to head with Dragon Hunter Elmer, 1979's Bugs Bunny's Looney Christmas Tales, where he appeared sporadically radically as a caroler, and in the short, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Bunny, featured in Bugs Bunny's Bustin' Out All Over, which saw Elmer and Bugs as children. He also appeared briefly in Wraparounds in 1979's Bugs Bunny's Valentine, as Cupid helping Bugs fall in love, 1980's Bugs Bunny's Mystery Special, as a police inspector on the hunt for a fugitive Bugs, and in 1982's Bugs Bunny's Mad World of Television, as a meta version of himself recording a cartoon in a TV studio. Soon after, in attempt to return the tunes to their theatrical roots, a series of package movies were released, two of which likewise featured classic Elmer cartoons. As a result of these films' popularity, the Looney Tunes starred in a number of theatrically released cartoon shorts in the early 90s, the first since the 60s. Elmer first appeared in 1991's Box Office Bunny as a theatre usher who teams up with Daffy to remove a freeloading Bugs from a screening he didn't pay for, and then again in 1995's Carrot Blanca, a parody of classic film Casablanca. However, his appearance here only lasted a couple of frames. Additionally, Elmer starred in Blooper Bunny, a faux cartoon gag reel starring the tunes. While this short was created in 1991, it never received its intended theatrical release, instead debuting on television in 1997. Elmer also appeared in 1992's Invasion of the Bunny Snatchers, a similarly meta short which begins with Bugs filming cartoons with Elmer and Sam. This one was also planned for a theatrical release, but was instead bundled into TV special Bugs Bunny's Creature Features. The 90s and early 2000s also saw an enormous boom in TV animation for Warners, and Elmer made numerous cameos throughout the era's most popular series. In Tiny Toon Adventures, he appeared as one of the teachers at Acme Looniversity. Like other tunes in the series, Elmer had his own protege, Elmira Duff, a youthful female version of him. While Elmira could be considered a series villain, the pain and discomfort she inflicts on others, specifically the animal characters, is unintended, as she simply shows them too much affection. Elmira was so popular she was given her own spin-off series, the short-lived Pinky Elmira and the Brain, which saw her adopt Pinky and the Brain from Animaniacs. Speaking of, Alma additionally made a number of appearances in Animaniacs, both in Wacko, Yakko and Dot Story and in Pinky and the Brain ones. He also appeared in an episode of The Sylvester and Tweety Mysteries as a private eye who aids the team on a case. Later, he's also revealed to be Granny's ex-lover. 
In another episode of the series, the Fat Elmer variant cameos as a comedy club owner in Moscow. In Hysteria, he was used to portray Gutson Borgla, the sculptor of Mount Rushmore, in an episode telling the story of President Theodore Roosevelt, and then featured as himself in a later episode. In Baby Looney Tunes, Elmer appeared both as Baby Elmer, an infant version of himself, and also as a four-year-old bully of Bugs and Daffy. In the Duck Dodgers series, he was depicted as evil alien supervillain Mother Fudd, and in Lunatics Unleashed, his futuristic descendant Electro J Fudd emerged as a skilled hunter, out for revenge on Ace Bunny and Danger Duck, the descendants of Bugs and Daffy. Elmer additionally featured in the early 2000s webtoons in a series of ensemble shorts, and also starred in a number of them, including Cropsy Curvy, which saw him up against Bugs, who wants to be a Martian Air, where he's abducted by Marvin, Wild King Dum, where he narrates a Wily e. Coyote and Roadrunner chase, and The Matrix, a parody of Warner's The Matrix. Alma also starred in a number of feature films throughout the 90s and 2000s. In 1996's Space Jam, he joined the Tunes and basketball superstar Michael Jordan in forming the Tune Squad in order to free themselves from the clutches of alien invaders. Here, he appeared with 3D shading effects to make him look more realistic and allow him to stand out from live action backdrops. In 2003's spiritual follow up, Looney Tunes Back in Action, he showed up for a memorable hunting sequence, where he chases Bugs and Daffy through numerous paintings at the Louvre. In 2006's straight to home media movie Bar Humduck A Looney Tunes Christmas, a Looney retelling of Dickens' A Christmas Carol, he was also seen as one of the disgruntled workers of Daffy's Lucky Duck Superstore. 2012 saw the release of Daffy's Rhapsody, one of numerous revival shorts produced to capitalise on the latest 3D fad, which featured a classic Elmer vs Daffy screwball chase. Released alongside Journey to the Mysterious Islands, it was the first cartoon to depict the characters in CG animation. 2011 saw the debut of The Looney Tunes Show, which depicted the tunes in a modern suburbanite setting. Here, Elmer featured in a semi-recurring role as the local weatherman. While in his traditional design, he was given a clean, modern edge, his most significant overhaul since the 1940s. In the series' final episode, Elmer's evil twin brother appeared as an antagonist to Bugs' Super Rabbit. Elmer also appeared in 2015's direct-to-video spin-off movie Looney Tunes Rabbit's Run, in the role of an FBI agent out to capture Bugs and Lola after they invent an invisibility perfume with disastrous consequences. That same year, the new Looney Tunes series, called Wabbit in its first season, premiered. Again, Elmer appeared sporadically, usually in his traditional role of Bugs and Daffy antagonist, however, he occasionally teamed up with them. While he was often depicted in his hunter uniform, he took on numerous other professions throughout the series. Here, he was given his most stylized, zaniest design to date, with animators embracing the screwball style of the early tunes. Notably, the size of his head was completely exaggerated, and his hunter's hat was made comedically large. Currently, Elmer is appearing in HBO Max's Looney Tunes cartoons, in a vintage-inspired style, where he's once again pitted against bugs in a series of classic conflict shorts. Again, while Elmer is often seen as a hunter, many cartoons depict him in other professions and outfits. Even though his aggressive and oafish nature is still intact, and the gag pieces he appears in are incredibly violent, a controversy arose over the fact that he was not depicted with guns in the first season of episodes. In instead relying on other weaponry from the classic Toon arsenal. While Elmer's shotgun is an inherently important object to the character's hunter depiction, it's worth noting he hadn't used them since 2012's Daffy's Rhapsody, and as evidenced in this video, were not always seen in the original cartoons or comics. His guns returned, albeit briefly, in the series' second season. In 2021, Elmer additionally starred in Space Jam A New Legacy, where he once again joins the tunes in reforming the Tune Squad, this time to 
save NBA superstar LeBron James from a rogue algorithm in the Warner Brothers serververse. Throughout the movie, Alma appears in both a traditionally animated style and a 3D computer animated style. While Alma continues into the future, it's interesting to note that his original design has made numerous appearances in later years, though strangely billed as Egghead, further leading to the ongoing confusion. This variant appeared in 1988's TV special Daffy Duck's Quackbusters, where he briefly stopped by to mock Daffy, Looney Tunes Back in Action, where he quickly walks past the screen in the film's finale, and in a recent Looney Tunes cartoons episode where he turned up to celebrate Bugs' 90th birthday. Despite having been utilised less and less over the years, it's really great to see Alma back in form for the current slate of cartoons and projects, hopefully restoring his place as a truly wonderful use of conflict in the loony world and as one of Warner's greatest characters of them all. And at that, I'm throwing it over to you. I want to know, what is your favourite Alma Fudd design and appearance? Fire away down in the comments below and let me know your thoughts. Hey everyone, if you haven't yet, smash that big old subscribe button up on your screen to keep up to date with all my content and hit that like button down below. Also don't forget to check me out on social media and please consider supporting me over on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month for exclusive videos, early access content and to get your name up on the screen. Thanks again for watching.